Good afternoon, everyone. I am Melissa Majerol, a Master of Science candidate in Health Policy and Management here at the Harvard School of Public Health. I'm very pleased to introduce to you today Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Fauci is an immunologist and has served as the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases since 1984, where he oversees research to diagnose, prevent, and treat infectious diseases such as HIV, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. He, serves as a, he, he is also head of the clinical physiology section in the Laboratory of Clinical Investigation at the National Institutes of Health. He serves as a key advisor to the White House and Department of Health and Human Services on global AIDS issues and on public health preparedness against infectious disease. Dr. Fauci has made breakthrough contributions to understanding how the HIV virus creates an autoimmune deficiency response in the body. He has also contributed to key developments to an HIV vaccine and in HIV therapies for patients living with the disease. Owing to his major research contributions in this area, Dr. Fauci was the world's 10th most cited HIV AIDS researcher from 1996 through 2006. He is the recipient of numerous prestigious awards and holds 38 honorary doctoral degrees from universities all over the world. He received his medical degree from, universe, from Cornell University Medical College. It is such a great honor to have him with us today. Before I turn the session over to Dean David Hunter, who will be moderating today, please join me in welcoming Dr. Anthony Fauci to the Voices from the Field series at the Harvard School of Public Health. Thank you, Melissa, for that introduction, and good afternoon to everyone. This leadership series entitled Decision Making Voices from the Field focuses on leaders who've made major contributions in the field of science, government, and health, and who've also had to make tough decisions during their career. We are being webcast worldwide. In addition to the studio audience of students and faculty from the Harvard School of Public Health, and we hope our student studio audience will uh, ask many questions. I urge you to have your questions ready when I open the session to questions and answers. As Melissa said, today we, mention, we uh, welcome Dr. Tony Fauci with us. Uh, he's one of the world's leading researchers and scientific administrators, particularly in HIV. I won't repeat the uh, biography and all of his accomplishments. Uh, the purpose today is not to talk about his many scientific accomplishments, to talk about his experience and accomplishments as a leader and uh, how he has managed to lead one of the uh, largest national institutes through a uh, pandemic uh, unprecedented in human history over the last 30 years. So Tony, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to dial the clock back uh, almost 30 years towards the start of your term as director of the NIAID. And uh, early in your tenure, you faced an unusual challenge, the, the rise of citizen activism and patient activism uh, we weren't accustomed to having at the table when funding decisions and scientific direction decisions were being made, uh, patients and uh, advocates. And things got tough. There were demonstrations uh, close to your office, uh, calls for your resignation. So how did you uh, manage to navigate through that leadership challenge uh, which was really quite threatening to the scientific status quo, maybe even to your authority. Right. Well, it was a, a very difficult period, but it was a period that I think was very transforming in how we think about the role of constituents who are deeply involved in a disease, particularly a disease at the point with first no etiology and then an etiology and no, and no treatment. Um, it was one of those times where I made a decision that I think was one of the best decisions in my life, and that is to go by the principle that when people criticize, even people who look different, act different than you, don't come from the same background as you, start criticizing you in a very uh, iconoclastic way, that there's always some degree and sometimes a big degree of truth in what they're saying. Mm. So rather than run away from the activists, which m most, if not all, of my scientific colleagues did because they were challenging the scientific model. Only scientists can know what's the best thing to do in a disease. Mm. Only scientists would know how to 
designed a clinical trial that they kind of uh, shied away, not shied away, ran away from them. I, I started to just listen to what they were saying, and even though they were attacking me personally, and the reason I was being attacked personally, because very early on in the years of the pandemic, I was one that was out there. I was on television, I was in the radio, I was in the newspapers as the federal government. Mm. And at the time when Reagan was president, he, for a number of reasons, did not even mention the word AIDS until his second term. So when the activists justifiably wanted some say in their fate, their fate being, where is the research going? What about access to clinical trials? I became the face of the federal government. So when they started demonstrating, they were demonstrating on campus in front of my office, like, why aren't you releasing more drugs? Not realizing that I'm not the FDA, I don't do that. Uh, why don't you do this and why don't you do that? So what I did is that I brought them into my office the first time ever anybody did. So rather than have them arrested, I sat down and started to listen to what they were saying. And it became clear to me that despite the drama, despite the theater, they were making absolute perfect sense that it was unconscionable for the government when you have no alternative to go by the old rules. There's a clinical trial, you could only have 100 people in it and your hematocrit has to be this level and your BUN has to be this level, otherwise you're not gonna get into the trial, as opposed to saying, why don't we do the clinical trial and let access to other people. So it was a difficult time, but once you got past the, you know, I, I, I used to joke around and say I took the old model from The Godfather, it's nothing personal, it's strictly business. And it was strictly business for them. There wasn't anything personal against me. And as it turned out, many of the activists have become and are now some of my closest friends and colleagues. And, and how did you approach, uh, you suggested a lot of your colleagues weren't quite so enlightened well, quite so tough. quickly. That was tough. So I, had, I, I found myself in a very interesting position of being an established member of the scientific community and then going against the scientific community. Mm -hmm. And, and it, was, it was not easy because my colleagues who I respected and liked and grew up with did not want me to let the activists into the dialogue. Mm -hmm. And there was one rather transforming and I think historic situation where I began to meet much to the dismay of my colleagues with the activists, either in my home in DC or in the home of my deputy or coming to New York in the, in, to Greenwich Village or the Castro District of San Francisco and meeting with them and listening to them. Then I made the decision we were gonna let them into our discussions of clinical trial design which was sacrosanct, God forbid anybody but a, a scientist would go into that. And some of my colleagues got up and essentially said, we don't really want you here. And I had to make a decision of essentially doing things which is very painful, of getting rid of some of my, the people that worked for me because they did not want to, what I say, leap into the reality of having to deal with that. And that wasn't an easy thing to do. When you talk about, we're talking about leadership, I mean, that was leadership, but that was painful leadership because I had to take people that I liked and that I respected and say, you can't work for me anymore because as far as I'm concerned, the activists are gonna be part of what we do. And, and this model of leadership seems to have generalized to a lot of other diseases. Right. Uh, is that a positive development across the board? No, I think it is. Uh, the, the activists did a lot of things that were very theatrical to gain attention. Hmm because nobody was listening to them. They were suffering, they were afraid, justifiably afraid. They saw all of their lovers and their colleagues getting decimated. I mean, if you look at the numbers that I think people today who, you know, I think of my own children who, who were just born at the time, that didn't know what it was like when you walk down the street in Greenwich Village or you walk down the street in the Castro district of San Francisco, more than 50% of the gay population was infected. I mean, that means half of the people walking around the street were gonna die because there was no therapy. So the, the fear and the concern, it was out of sync with how people were responding. And when they became very iconoclastic to gain attention, once they got the attention of the people that they wanted to, to be heard by, by myself and others, then when you listen to what they said, boy, they made sense. So it was the, 
the public picture of activism. Some may remember, you know, they chained themselves to the Wall Street. They went into St. Patrick's Cathedral and grabbed the chalice from the priest and threw it on the floor. People would just not be able to relate to that. That's crazy. But what they were crying out for was, we're dying. You know, you got to do something. So, so another uh, element in the early days was, I think, we were both at the first HIV conference where the then Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, predicted that there'd be a vaccine in testing in two years. This was 1985. And uh, enormous optimism, obviously, in the air at that time. Now the virus had been identified. Right. Um, 30 years later, we don't have a vaccine. H how do you approach the challenge of uh, leading, as one of the major funders of vaccine research in this area, an enterprise which takes a lot longer to get to the desired right. endpoint than, than initially hoped? Well, well for, you have to manage expectations and you have to never overpromise and uh, and never be afraid to speak with reality of the truth. I mean, when one of the problems people have is that th they're afraid to say, I don't really know and I can't give you an answer. And there are a lot of times, particularly in science, where you just can't because a lot of science is discovery. So S S Secretary of HHS Margaret Heckler Poor Margaret got a really bad name because in 1985, 84 and a half, actually, she said that there would be a vaccine in testing in two years. And you know what? She was right. There was a vaccine in testing in 1987. Only we in the scientific community were understandably naive about what that meant because you isolated the virus, you take the envelope, and you stick it into somebody, and you assume, like any other virus, that you're going to make neutralizing antibodies that are going to neutralize primary isolates. So there was a vaccine in trial. A, she was correct, and B, the scientific community completely misjudged what that would mean. And you're right. Now, 20-plus years later, we still have, don't have a safe and effective vaccine, and there's a good reason for that, in that what we didn't know at the time is that unlike any other vaccine, the body doesn't really like to make a protective immune response against HIV. Hmm. It's one of the few viruses where the natural response to infection is not what you want. When I was in medical school, my mentor said the best way to develop a vaccine was to mimic natural infection. Hmm. Because with any disease, smallpox, polio, measles, People die, people have morbidity, but at the end of the day, the body clears the virus, eradicates it, and then you're protected for life against that re-challenge. Mm. That is absolutely not the case with HIV. So we were using a model of mimicking natural infection, which didn't work. So now we've got to do better than natural infection. We didn't know that in 1985, right. but that's for sure. And I assume you've had to go up in the hill and you know, explain this to yeah, Congress? Well, well, again, I, that's one of the things that you have to, and, and I think that's something that I learned from experience, sometimes hard knocks, is that you always have to be truthful and consistent. If you tell people things you think they want to hear, A, that's bad news to begin with, and B, that will destroy your credibility for being able to tell them things that you are sure about. Because it is tough to tell somebody, particularly somebody in a position of power, be that the chair of a, an appropriations committee that gives you your budget, or the president of the United States, that I've had the, the privilege of dealing with five of them since, since Reagan, is that you're, you're, you have almost a natural aversion of disappointing people. And sometimes the right thing is to disappoint them. You know, I, I don't know the answer to this, or I don't know when we are going to have X, Y, and Z. That's tough, but that's the only way to go. Otherwise, y y your credibility is gone pretty quickly. So, so you've been an advisor to five presidents. You've uh, been able to introduce and influence many major, major large-scale projects, such as the PEPFAR program. Uh, do you have any advice for us on how you talk to non-scientists, uh, politicians, yeah. people in power without talking down to them? Yeah. Well. I learned a long time ago that if you're a scientist and you're there because of your scientific credibility, the time to be really smart and appear smart is when you're doing the experiment, you're analyzing your data. When you're trying to explain something to somebody, the goal is not to appear 
to be so smart. Mm. The goal is to be understood. Mm. <laughs> so <laughs> the problem is, I know when I, I tell this to fellows in my laboratory when they go and present in front at meetings, that uh, I would rather deliver a speech or a lecture or a commentary to 100 people in a room where 98% of them understand what I'm saying hmm. rather than have 2% of them think I'm really brilliant. Hmm. Because if you go and aim at the 2% and say, wow, boy, that's really terrific, and the 98% of them are scratching their head saying, what did he say? Then you failed. And that's what happens when you go before the Congress. And that's certainly what happens when you have the limited time you have when you go into the White House. Mm. You've got to have, you know, what is the question? What is my message? And you have a very short time to do it and just be crystal clear. The other thing I think that's a very important principle is to be consistent. Uh, you know, you, you, you have to have a certain fundamental set of principles that guide how you advise somebody. And don't you can't change them. You've got to be consistent. And sometimes your consistency is going to be, have a negative impact on somebody and sometimes it's going to have a positive. But if you're consistent, then in the long range, you're going to be very effective. So we, we have uh, younger faculty here, we have students and postdocs, and uh, they're all anxious about their future. So some of your colleagues just this week published a opinion piece, right. uh, including Harold Varmus, uh, your colleague is NCI director, your previous boss, I guess, is director of NIH. Right. And they painted a rather uh, scary picture of the sort of end of the era of the endless frontier in uh, ever expanding scientific discovery and uh, pointed out that the resources are starting to become limiting right. for that discovery. You've been uh, running an AID in times of plenty, times of scarcity. You've had to balance the uh, intramural scientists that work with you locally, with the uh, thousands of scientists you support around the country and internationally. D did your approach to leadership change when, between the good times and the tough times? Um, I, I would say no. Your, your approach to leadership should be consistent because I, I, I believe that leadership to be effective has to be driven by certain fundamental principles, some of which I mentioned about consistently, honesty, you know, going with your gut, but making everything you do be data-driven uh, and evidence-based as opposed to just flinging out. But the question that you're asking is when we have difficult times, I mean, obviously, they are difficult times. The NIH budget has been flat for the last 10 years, and that's not even counting the sequestration, which took away $1.5 billion. And when you have a 2% inflationary increase each year, that's 20% decrease in purchasing power. And that's what Harold Varmus and Shirley Tillman and Bruce Alberts and others spoke about in the PNAS article that came out this week. And they were talking about not changing leadership, but, but managing expectations. Uh, and taking a look at, like, the people we're training, does everybody have to be an independent PI now? When you had the acceleration of the NIH when it doubled over five years, the goal and the success standard is that I want to get my doctorate, do research, be an independent PI, and have my own lab. Mm -hmm. Now, that's great, but that doesn't mean if you don't do that that you're a fail that there are a lot of other things that you could do in science, and, you, and science is becoming much bigger. It's becoming team science. The idea about individual competitiveness, and that was one of the paragraphs in that paper, are we becoming so competitive that we're competing ourselves out of business? It, it's, a, it's a sobering article, but I don't think that it changes how leadership should be. What it does is have a realistic evaluation of the circumstances and really focus on the fact that although support changes, scientific opportunities, if anything, are more breathtaking now than they were during the years of plenty. So rather than discouraging people from going into science, I think we need to get people to realize that the scientific landscape is a little bit different, but the opportunities and the excitement of science, if anything, is even more than it's ever been. So you mentioned the old paradigm, which was the single PI with a lab. Uh, you know, most PIs didn't 
receive any specific training in leadership, but they right. may, might pick it up from a mentor or by observing those around them. As we move towards more of a team science uh, approach, how should younger scientists adjust their leadership expectations and leadership styles uh, to be able to function in this multidisciplinary team science world as opposed to the world that in many ways they're still being trained in, which is how to emulate uh, a single leader who's the apex of a laboratory. Right. Well, you know, I, I look at leadership as, as something that isn't just a unidimensional thing. I mean, there's official leadership mm -hmm. where you're the head of a laboratory and you have responsibilities and powers and whatever. And then there's, you know, the leadership of example. I mean, even if you're not officially a leader, and I think the latter sometimes is even more important than the other. I mean, in team science, uh, although there's a team leader and then there's people at this level, I mean, people at, at levels here can just show leadership by their own performance. So I wouldn't get too hung up on how do I get to be an official leader as opposed to how do I lead by example and then all of a sudden you find out that you're a leader and people look to you whether you're you know at this level of the team or at that level of the team. And, and, and as one of the leading voices uh, for progress in fighting the HIV epidemic, also as a federal official, uh, you must have faced situations where internationally you saw uh, countries, presidents putting in place policies that you thought weren't adequately enlightened right. or state of the art. Uh, how do you balance your uh, personal and professional desire to try and do something about that situation with your responsibilities to behave in a diplomatic way sure. on behalf of the government? Uh, good question, and it has to be a delicate balance because you don't want to shy away from responsibilities that almost border on a moral responsibility of doing something because mm -hmm. you are in a position that you it wouldn't be particularly good to offend someone and saying, you know, I've had it happen to me. U.S. official says, and oh dear, you know, <laughs> you know what that means that you're going to get a few phone calls from downtown. But um, <laughs> I can give you an example of something okay. that I was involved with, a couple of examples in which I, I took the chance of publicly speaking out against something that was going on um, and it could have led to some diplomatic feathers being ruffled, but it was so clear what needed to be done. And that was the early dealings that we had with South Africa when uh, Manto Shalabalala Misamang was the Secretary of Health and uh, Thabo Mbeki was the president. And the um, AIDS policies there about, uh, A, not even fully believing that HIV causes AIDS to essentially preventing the wide distribution of government-supported therapies for HIV, I thought was a complete outrage. Hmm. And I was very public about that. And there were a couple of people, uh, I say downtown, ranging from the Congress to the White House to saying, well, maybe you, you better tone it down a little. And I said, I'm not going to tone it down. How could, I, how could I not speak out against something that I think you know, borders on being almost criminal? Uh, and that was it. And I did it, and that was OK. Uh, um, but sometimes you got to be careful. Right now, I mean, I'm very actively speaking out uh, about the egregious situation in Uganda hmm. with the outlawing of homosexuality. I mean, they've, I have clinics in Uganda, in the Rakai district, hmm. in which we actively recruiting gay men, and, and we're putting them at, at danger because of that. And, and we, we, we just can't tolerate that. And I mean, if my being public, and I've been public here on this, and I'll be public on TV, and I say the same thing. And if somebody gets offended by that, that's too bad. That's where you draw the line, and you don't worry about the consequences. Are, are there situations in your career where you've had to essentially suppress the urge to speak out like this in order for some greater good, to, to keep a trial going, to keep a clinical setting, not to get thrown out of the country, or something like that? Um, <laughs> not really. I. Um, there are a couple of instances, uh, one in which I did speak out against something that was right, mm. that was our own government, and mm. it was chancy, I, I was risky, and there was another time when I didn't. Mm. So I had been um, tasked by 
Secretary Shalala during the Clinton administration to be part of a group that examined the data to determine if needle exchange programs, which were not supported by the federal government, A, did they promote illicit drug use, and B, did they uh, decrease uh, HIV infection by needle exchange. And I looked at the data with several of my colleagues, and overwhelmingly, needle exchange programs did not promote the use of drugs. People were going to use them or not. It didn't make any difference if you gave them clean needles. And B, there's no doubt that it decreased the infection. So I made the strong recommendation to the administration, to the President Clinton, that we should federally fund uh, uh, needle exchange programs. And for a variety of reasons, they decided not to. Uh, that's one where I could have gone out and really gone public and saying that was a horrible decision, but I didn't. I modified it and say, well, then let the states do it, which was sort of a way of saying you really should be doing it, but let the states do it. Um, and I think that was a wise decision because President Clinton, who has done fantastic things since uh, he was president, particularly the Clinton Foundation, which is really an extraordinary uh, organization in a positive way, has said that that was a bad decision on his part, that he should have federally funded. But there was a lot of pressure not to, pressure even among the African-American inner city community that did not want it done because it felt like you were giving up on them. So that was one example where I just toned down the rhetoric because I understood the difficult position that President Clinton was in. On another scale, when I went the opposite direction, was back when the drugs were being tested before we had triple combination, the activist community wanted me to come out because I had really developed a very strong relationship with them and say that people who were ineligible for a clinical trial should have the opportunity to have access to drug outside of the clinical mm -hmm. trial. We call that parallel track. And there was an activist in San Francisco named Marty Delaney, who was a very close friend of mine, and a couple of ACT UP people in New York, Jim Igo and others, who were really pushing me to do that. And they felt it would only happen if someone of my visibility came out. The FDA and the Department of Health and Human Services was completely against that because they thought it would essentially disrupt the integrity of the clinical trial process. And I went to San Francisco and, and saw the havoc that this was reaping. People were not able to get on drug, even though they absolutely needed it, if anything, just for hope because mm -hmm. of the rigid guidelines. And I just got up at a town hall meeting in downtown San Francisco and publicly said that I completely disagree with the government's uh, policy of not allowing parallel track. And I urged us to do that. Mm -hmm. And Fortunately or unfortunately, there was a New York Times reporter in the front row at the town hall meeting, and it made the front page of the New York Times the next day, and the San Francisco Examiner, and the LA Times, and I thought that I was in some serious trouble, but I wasn't, because as soon as I said that, all of a sudden everyone said, wow, that's probably what we should do, and that's what we actually did. But I, that was a time when, as you were alluding to, I was not sure what would happen to me, because it was very public coming out again by a government official against the government policy, which is not a smart thing to do sometimes. Wow. Right. Uh, a profile in courage. So uh, <laughs> let's open it up to the audience. Uh, please just raise your hand. You'll get a microphone. Uh, announce your name and affiliation. And please ask your question to Dr. Fauci. Uh, second row, and then Steve. Well, thank you. Hello. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fauci, for being here with us today. It's a, it's a great honor to have you here. My name is Leo. I'm, a, I'm an MPH student here at the School of Public Health and Healthcare Policy and Management. And I have a simple question for you. It's not quite simple, actually, but uh, the formulation it is. So we, uh, we have been taught and we have several examples of you know, how um, change and leading change, it's easier when it's, there's a sense of emergency out there. So my question to you is, a, do you think that sense of emergency is fading away with um, HIV AIDS? And B, if it is, um, how, do you, how do you plan on sort of like getting, um, you know, keeping the attention of different stakeholders on, on the issue? That's an excellent question, and, and it is a danger, uh, as a matter of fact. And the way around it is to continue to articulate 
um, without hand waving, but for good scientific reasons, why um, it may not be, quote, an emergency, but it is certainly still in crisis mode. Um, we have 50,000 new infections each year in this country for the last 15 years in a row, which is unconscionable. I mean, the numbers went up in the early years to 125, 130,000 a year, then they came down and then they stayed at 50. That's unacceptable. Uh, even though we're making great strides in decreasing of new infections and decreasing in deaths due to treatments as well as preventions, we still have 2.6 million new infections and 1.3 million deaths a year globally. So you have to keep articulating that when you're dealing with an epidemic that's dynamic in nature and is not over, that almost by definition constitutes an emergency. At a congressional hearing that I testified at about a week and a half ago, a member of Congress asked me that same question. Why should we putting any more money into HIV AIDS because we have essentially solved the problem? And the answer without being confrontative with the person who was a very smart person and a very good person, so it was not a completely crazy question, was that we are still, I mean, it was comparing numbers. We have these number of people who, are, who die of cancer each year and these number of people who die of heart disease and these number of people who die of HIV AIDS. So why are we giving 10% of the NIH budget to HIV AIDS? And the answer is that we have an extraordinary opportunity to put an end to a pandemic. And once it's over, then you don't have to worry about spending money on it anymore. So that's really the answer. Roger? Well, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Stephen Gilman on the faculty here. Uh, you've certainly, um, you've alluded to the state of the science changing over your, uh, uh, over your career in this area. And I wanted to ask you how you approach policy questions when the science, the underlying science is uncertain. Uh, we like to say, we always like to say more research is needed, but I'm not sure if that's always the right answer for you. And a corollary is how you approach policy decisions when a single study is published that seems to overturn existing knowledge. Right. Well, that's a good question. Well, it, po policy, when the science doesn't back it, um, is, is tricky. Uh, and that's when you've really got to use essentially best judgment. Um, so we've had situations like that uh, in the past with regard to, for example, um, widespread treatment. In, in fact, we're in the, we have a, a situation even currently right now of treating everybody when they are, get infected first. Right? And as a physician who takes care of a lot of HIV-infected individuals, I feel that the earlier you treat somebody, the better, uh, particularly when you have drugs that are much less toxic. And the fact that we know that the earlier you treat, the more preservation of immune function, the lower, the smaller the reservoir. Yet the definitive trial to prove the risk benefit of that has not yet been done. Uh, it's being done. So my, the policy now is sort of like a 50-50. And that is you recommend it to the person, but you explain the risk benefit as opposed to making it official policy. So, but if uh, official policy is different than a person, if you, if you were HIV infected and came into my clinic and you were infected, I would treat you immediately. But does that mean that we write the guidelines? Not yet, not yet. The other thing on the other side of the coin is what happens when you get a single study that seems to, to me a single study is is a single study. <laughs> so I don't change anything on a single study unless it really is a slam dunk. And there aren't a lot of single studies that are slam dunks. Right. Uh, hi, my name is Jackie Murdoch. I'm an MPH student here at the School of Public Health. Um, I was at a Harvard event last week where a lecturer from the dental school spoke about the uh, pandemic of digital misinformation about fluoridation um, and other things like vaccines. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts on how scientists and health professionals can help counter this digital misinformation, um, whether we should engage with it or whether that validates that viewpoint and, and sort of 
uh, makes it an either or, or if you have any other ideas on how we can lead on this issue, which is, you know, starting to show effects of measles cases in right. New York City. And That's an excellent question that I've unfortunately have had the opportunity, but not the pleasure of having to get involved with. And the only thing that I can say is that you have to continue without um, ad hominem attacks on the people who are doing it, because then it becomes something that loses sight of what the science base of what you're talking about and continue to articulate in a measured way the scientific basis for what you're talking about. I mean, the, the, and it's not that easy uh, because sometimes it calls upon um, a group to uh, take a risk that they feel are not taking a risk. Let me give you the, the measles example. So if a person says to themselves, there is a finite risk of an adverse event with measles, and I don't want my child to have that risk, so let the rest of the community get vaccinated and my child will be protected by, by herd immunity. You have to appeal to the um, almost moral imperative as a member of the community for that person to do that. On the other hand, you've got to very clearly disabuse them of the incorrect scientific uh, premise that measles results in autism, which it doesn't. So you're kind of you're stuck. Is measles vaccine 100% safe? Nothing is 100% safe that you intervene medically. Nothing is 100% safe. Does measles result in autism? Absolutely not. So it's the kind of thing where you've got to keep drilling home the science without accusing the other party of being crazy because that's the way they feel. And they're based on disinformation. And disinformation is very difficult, particularly when celebrities get involved in, in pitching in. It's very, very tough to argue against someone who's very well known and very attractive and very much liked publicly. Question, uh, second row, great. Hi, thanks so much for all your comments. Um, my name is Alyssa Karen. I'm the um, program manager for the PEPFAR program in Tanzania. Um, uh, you mentioned earlier that there's been a bit of um, lack of information leading to some policy changes around HIV treatment globally. Um, I'm particularly interested to get your thoughts on the sort of financial implications and also health implications of the rollout of option B plus globally, um, which is being rolled out in several countries at the moment. Right. So you without want to know, you want, you an evidence base. Uh, without a robust evidence base. Well, okay, so it depends on what you mean by robust evidence based. Um, uh, so, so let me just tell you how I feel about it, okay? Based on some evidence that may not saying that we did B plus all over and this is what we have, but we, we know as a fact that if you suppress viral load in a mother to below detectable level, that it is extraordinarily unlikely that that mother will transmit the virus to the baby intrapartum, perinatal, or through breastfeeding. There's no doubt about that. So the question is, is the implementation of B plus from an economic resource allocation standpoint valid? That's, that's that's your question. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> that is a, more of a, the implementation side. Exactly. And it's really implemented. And we don't know the answer to that because it really varies from country to country. And the point that you're making is an excellent point. It, it really differs depending upon the resource. In the perfect world where you had all the resources, there'd be no doubt that implementation of that would be the appropriate. And the question is, in some countries who have limited resources, should they be doing something else, treating P 
people who are below a certain CD4 level or giving PrEP or not. I mean, that's the thing that we continually are having to balance one against the other. Um, when do you start, if someone comes into a clinic whose CD4 count is 400, 500, and you know that a year and a half from now it might be 200 or 300, do you treat them while you have them? Or do you wait, send them away and wait for the person whose CD4 count is 100 to come in? That's the same sort of question you're asking about Plan B. And I, and I think there's no really good answer to that. I am one, if you want to just go by gut, as it were, as opposed to not that you don't want evidence-based or implementation science, but sometimes you have to make a decision. Mine is when you have somebody there that you can treat, treat them and worry about what's going to happen later. So, so Tony, we were talking there about implementation and costs. Right. Um, I think even 15, certainly 20 years ago, the dogma was that you couldn't have two-tier pricing for antiretrovirals. Oh, uh, now we have multi-tier pricing. Right. We face a new situation with hepatitis C right. virus, and I'm sure NIAID has funded much of the work. Yes. Uh, but the drugs now cost you know, upwards of $100,000 for a course, but may result in a cure. Right. So, so, so how do you, as a leader of the effort to get these therapies to patients, uh, equilibrate the fact that somebody has to make the drug, they have costs they have to recover, um, can, can we live in a world where uh, the patent system essentially mandates high prices for a long time and then generics with much, much uh, uh, lower cost? Or, or is the example of HIV admittedly separated by countries an example of a kind of sliding scale where the uh, ability to pay is considered in the access to the drugs? Yeah. Well, I, th that's an excellent question. It's highly relevant to not only HIV, but also to hepatitis C, as you mentioned. Um, so my tact has been for a very long time, still is, that you cannot tell pharmaceutical companies um, that they are investing a billion dollars to make a drug, and then, by the way, you've got to give it away. I mean, as a socially-minded being, I would love that we lived in that perfect world, but then you wouldn't have any new drugs that were any good. So that's a non-starter. On the other hand, I believe very strongly in the two-tier pricing. I think the argument for two-tier pricing way back was a spurious argument. And the argument for two-tier pricing is that if you uh, price something at, at 10x in the United States, and then you price it at a half an x in the developing world, then what's going to happen is that the people in the United States are going to say, you can't do that to us. If you can do it for half an X here, you should do a half an X there. That has proven to not be the case because, in fact, we are doing that. We have drugs that are worth thousands of dollars here in the United States for HIV, and we're selling it for $150, $95, $120 in the developing world. And it works. So I think that in order to um, maintain the incentive for companies to make major investments, to give them their profits, to allow them to charge a pretty good price for a period of time. I'm fully uh, in support of patents and patents running out with generics. But if a company wants to, like they're doing with Egypt, have Savastbuvir for $80,000 in the United States and charge you know, $100 in Egypt, that's fine. I think that's fine to do that. Whether or not $80,000 is the right price, I don't know, because you, you almost can never get that data. How much is it to make up for whatever it is that you put the investment in? But I think the idea of telling companies that they can't charge high amounts to make up the profit is, if, you, if we go that way, we're going to lose a lot of incentives for companies to make the drugs like they've made for hepatitis C, which at the end of the day, is going to cure hepatitis C, and then the expenses are going to plummet. And you need combinations, so you need more exactly. than one drug. Exactly. So. We have time for a few last questions. Haman? Thank you very much for being here uh, and to share with us your knowledge, experience, and leadership, and mainly in this year in the centennial of the school. 
My name is Germán Orrego. I'm a doctoral student in the uh, Department of Environmental Health. And by the way, I am an engineer. But the first thing that I learned here in the school was that when we are in front of a, a pandemic, a pandemia, we need to cut the source. Uh, this is the first. And I was thinking that uh, in the case of HIV, which is the source of the pandemic, uh, and how we can cut the source, to stop the source. Okay. So let me, let me answer that question from a, a different thing. We've got to be careful. You're an engineer, you say, so you, you think very mathematically and precisely as a point source that you can get rid of the source. But when the source springs a million points, then you don't have a source anymore. You have a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that's the definition of it. So what you can do is that once it's spread beyond a single source, then you've got to deal with how you deal with pandemics. And you deal with pandemics, depending upon the type of it is, is by prevention and by treatment. Unfortunately, HIV is a disease that is measured over many, many years. The good news is that treatment can be prevention. So we have a couple of ways of getting our arms around the pandemic. One is standard preventions, low-tech things, condom use, needle exchange, behavior modification, and medically involved things. Prevention of mother-to-child transmission, circumcision, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. But the interesting thing also is that when you treat someone appropriately and adequately, we now have totally evidence-based proof that you make it extraordinarily unlikely, less than 1%, probably 0.15% chance that that person will transmit to another person. So it's interesting, getting back to the fact that we'd like a perfect world, that we don't have one, but if we could get closer to a perfect world and implement voluntary testing, linking to care, keeping in care, putting on therapy, staying on therapy, for everybody that's infected, you could turn the epidemic off. You could totally turn it off because people would not be transmitting infection to each other. And once you get in a pandemic, forgetting point source, the dynamics start to go down. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Just like when it's on the way up, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. More people get infected. When it's on its way down, even without accelerating anything, they're going to be less and less people, and that's how you're going to get rid of it. Questions? Thank you for your um, talk. My name is Christian. I'm from Indonesia. I'm here, an, MP an MPH student in health policy. Uh, you mentioned two points about the power of the public media in um, shaping the public opinion. You mentioned that um, it has helped you influence the public, but it, you also mentioned that it could be misinformed by the celebrities and all that. So I was wondering, what is your, um, what do you feel that we should do as a public health practitioner and also a he public health scientist to um, take part and interact with the media, mm -hmm. especially to help um, um, to help take part in this HIV AIDS case? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a very good question. I really do think that the scientific and public health community should begin well, not begin because some are already doing it, should feel very comfortable with the use of public fora, including and particularly the media, in getting a message across of public health. One of the problems is that in science, uh, the use of the media sometimes is a bit self-serving, that people use the media to... Um, make a press release on something that when you look at on its face value is quite misleading. You see that every single day, some brand, I mean, there's, if everything that got into the newspaper was the breakthrough that it was supposed to be, then we would all be out of a job because everything would be taken care of, but it's not. But there's a responsible use of the media, namely for education and to getting evidence-based information across to people. So scientists should not shy away from using public fora to educate because the, the media people themselves 
don't feel it's their obligation to educate. They feel it's their obligation to report the news. But scientists can use the media to educate. I had a very sobering and interesting and educational and informative conversation with my friends in the media, New York Times reporters and producers for the networks, when I would urge them and I would say, David, why don't you get out there and say this? And they would say, my job, not me, but their job, was not to educate anybody, it was mm. to report the news and to editorialize on the news. It's the scientist's <laughs> opportunity and obligation to educate through the media. So I would go for it. It's a very good way. I mean, you could get in front of a, a group of several hundred people and you really make an impression on them. If you get for 35 seconds on the nightly news, you get millions of people who would get the right message. And that's exactly, you, one of, somebody asked the questions about the measles situation. When the measles outbreak came in uh, New York City and in Orange County, I was on television a lot and I wanted to do it because I wanted to get that 35 second message about what happens when you stop vaccinating people. And that was very effective rather than saying, well, you know, I really don't want to do that. I don't want to get involved in that argument, but it was effective. Maybe one last question down the front here. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Tiffany. I'm a master's in public health student here um, in health policy and management. Um, and I'm also actually a medical student who does HIV AIDS activism and advocacy with the American Medical Student Association. Um, so no protests today, but no promises in the future. Um, <laughs> My question really has to do um, a lot because I do think, um, you mentioned some reasons that I think HIV AIDS work right now is a very exciting time because I do think with all the research that we have, we have a real opportunity to see maybe the end of, a, of an epidemic which has had such a huge impact on health. Um, and I want to ask, I think one of the issues that come up, especially in the example of Uganda, is that I think we're gonna see a lot of situations where they're very particular populations. Um, and this happens in the US where a lot of people are very isolated from um, from the general public. Um, and I think it's gonna become harder and harder to make arguments like you were saying about funding because these are gonna be people who are not really seen, you know, who are kind of ignored by society. Um, how do you think our leadership needs to change and our messaging needs to change as it becomes more and more kind of pinpointing these populations um, in terms of isolating points um, where the epidemic is still spreading? Right, so I think we should not be afraid to um, specifically target in a positive way the people who need help. One of the real problems we had in the beginning of the HIV AIDS pandemic was because of political correctness, we try to make it seem like it was an equal opportunity employee. It's not. It's very specific for people in certain areas. And we had to get over that. And we shouldn't be ashamed of that because we should treat everybody in society the same. That sounds you know, very idealistic, but it's the truth. And we shouldn't back off from that and be ashamed of that. If there's a public health problem that involves a certain segment of our population, it's our responsibility to take care of them. And if we really are what we say we are in the United States, then we should do it. As opposed to saying, well, you know, it's a disenfranchised group. Well, they shouldn't be disenfranchised. And we as public health officials should never, ever treat them. And I know I'm not saying that you do, as being disenfranchised. And we should unabashedly say that we have an obligation to take care of them. So Tony, just your final thoughts as we wrap up. Uh, lessons on leadership. Uh, I've heard consistency, uh, hewing close to the evidence base, maybe not being influenced by a single study unless it's a slam dunk. Uh, finding a way to communicate, including using mass media, so closer to 98% of people understand you than the 2% and occasionally courage and strength of conviction. Are there other elements that you'd like to share uh, with the audience about uh, how you approach leadership? Well, I, I've said a lot of, of the kinds of things that have driven me over, over the last you know, many years that I've been in a leadership position. Uh, one of the things that I, I find with decision making is really important and I tell everyone from my policy colleagues to the people in my laboratory, that when you're making a decision, whatever that might be, for your own career or for something that you want to do, you got to do a combination of getting as much information as you possibly can, as well as listening to your gut. There's a certain something that when you build up your own training, your own moral values, your own principles, 
that your instinct and your gut about how something feels is really important. If you just go by your gut without any evidence, then you're just sort of kind of a slave of your emotions. But if you go with evidence and never listen to how you really feel about it, yeah. uh, I think you can make mistakes. I've been well served by trying always to have that combination of getting as much information as I possibly can and then just asking myself, how does this feel? Does this feel right or not? And that really helps in my decision making. Wonderful. So I think we're out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank the audience here and around the world. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the staff for uh, the Voices in the Field series. We look forward to seeing you later this year in the fall at the next event. Uh, most of all, I'd like you all to join me in thanking Tony Fauci for sharing his uh, vision and thoughts and wisdom about leadership. Thank you. <laughs>